all got here, right? Yes. Amen. Just getting here sometimes a job, right? Yes. <laughs> we walk by faith, not by sight. And sometimes we get here, even though we don't feel like it, we know it's the right thing to do. Amen. We need to stay on the right path and on the right road, even when our emotions and our feelings are just trying to take us away from God. Amen. Because God is not a feeling, God is a fact. Okay? He's trying to teach us to walk by faith, not by what we see or how we feel. Amen. Amen. He's trying to uh, crucify our emotions so we can run. So we can walk in the spirit. Amen? Amen. Moses get the hold of us. Alright, we are on step four. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And the scripture tied into that is let us examine our ways and test them. And let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 340. So we're going to talk about this inventory that they talk about. Everybody's so afraid to take a look in the mirror. Um, the mirror of God's word will always expose what's wrong with us. Okay, and you read the if you read the Old Testament, there was kings that actually ripped the pages out of the Bible. They didn't want to hear. They didn't want to face anything. And we could turn the pages to and say, "Oh, that doesn't pertain to me. Oh, that's not how to do." Listen, Genesis to Revelations as pertains to you. You're a human being. You have a sin nature, and everything in the Bible is pertaining to us. Amen. Amen. You can't just displace it, okay? It's easy. We can justify a lot of our stuff, man, yeah, in the Bible. I want us to go to Colossians chapter 3, okay? Um, I can't tell you what page it's on because I have it up on my screen there. It doesn't tell me. So if you have your recovery Bible, you need a Bible back there, Mike? You got one? Yeah, Colossians chapter 3. 1540. I suggest you get familiar with your Bible because that's really the best tool you can have in recovery. Oh. Oh, oh. Sorry. That was close. Colossians, watch on? Three. Three. Sorry. 1534. Apostle <laughs> Paul was talking to the Colossians. That's all together now. 1534. Yeah. That was me. That was I don't know if anybody worked outside today, they know it's not it's very uncomfortable today. It's humid and sticky and I'm just grateful to be here. It seems to bring up the worst to me, that's for sure. I didn't open my mouth that much today because there wasn't much good in there coming up. Yeah. Else, so I didn't say anything. Good kind of good. Got the same thing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Don't ask me why. Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Amen? Look what it says now. The Apostle Paul was talking to Colossians, which are believers already. So, I want us to go in verse 5. And um, he's saying something again. He's talking to people who are already saved and believers. He's saying, in verse 5 of Colossians 3, he's saying, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. So obviously... You're saved, but there's still sinful, earthly things that are lurking within us. We can all agree on that, right? Yeah. Just because we're saved and going to heaven does not mean our flesh has been dealt with. At the cross it has, and we are going to heaven, but we're still stuck down here with this body that's stuck with sin. Look what it says. Lurking, lurking within you. Isn't that funny? When I hear that, I'm saying, the devil, he lurks. He's always inside there trying to lurk and bring and lure me into something. Always. The closer I get to God, the more lures the devil throws at me from my from my sin nature, trying to get me. But it tells us to put it to death. Now, in other words, so in other words, I'm saved, but my sin nature is still very much alive. You can all agree with that, right? Because we're still operating in it, right? So we get saved, yeah, that's a one-time event. Now what do we do from here on in? What the Bible teaches us is to what? Put to death our sin nature. That's, that's what we, from here on in, that's what we have to do. Now look what it says. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. Now it says in verse 7, you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. 
But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Wow. How do I get, I get a, the only way I'm going to learn to be, to be like my creator is if I read his word and let him be my mind. Look, we get a new heart as soon as we believe in God, but this mind has to get renewed. It's full of sin and darkness and all this stuff lurking within me. And this is where step four comes in. We don't even know what's lurking within us. God knows our heart better than we do. We think that we're not that bad. And we start comparing ourselves to other people. And it's saying, he's not talking to like one person here. He's talking about the human race, the sinful earthly things that lurk within us. All of us have these things lurking within us, and some of us are just failing to admit that they do. When you do admit it and you write it down on paper, God knows your heart, knows that you want to get rid of it, and you want to put on your new nature, which is the nature, very nature of God, which is in his word. But if you don't get rid of your old nature, don't think your new nature is ever going to take over. Never. You can sit here and go to church, go to Bible, it ain't going anywhere. Until you actually deal with your sin nature, throw it off and put on your new one. Don't you wish it happened by osmosis? All right, Lord, I believe in you. No, all of a sudden, yeah, all right, yeah, we're saved, but what? The wreckage is still in there. It's like there's stuff in here. Look, I've been doing this process for many, 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 many years. And there's still stuff that's being revealed that I never even knew I had inside of me. And God's given me his new nature. And you know what? You know how you know when you're, when you're dealing with yourself, yourself more than others? When you're looking at what's wrong with you and not what's wrong with others. Amen. Amen. And that's going to bring us to Matthew. Okay, let's go to, in, the, in the recovery Bible to Matthew chapter 7. Um... We're going to read six. step four. Boy, I'll tell you one thing about our sin nature. It is just one big justifier. And we're going to read finger pointers. See it? On page 1207. And then we're going to read the scriptures. Now, just let me have this say this, that if you have not locked the first three steps in, do not even attempt to do step four, because if you're not bringing God into this, you're only going to lie. You're only going to deceive yourself. If you don't let God show you your heart, he has to be involved with this, and he has to take over your life, and you can't use justification and say, well, I'm really not that bad. I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm not as bad as that. And I really haven't went down that road. Look, we've all been down that road. It's called the road that leads it's the sin road. <laughs> Whatever it is. The drugs, alcohol, anger, sex, jealousy. You name it, it's the sin road. We've all been down the sin road. Are we all in the same boat? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't need that. <laughs> oh, I guess you don't need recovery. As soon as you get saved, you're recovering from sin. Okay. From the rest of the minute you go home, how could you say you don't need recovery? That's what? Denial. <coughs> Look what it says. <coughs> there have probably been times when we have ignored our own sins and problems and pointed a finger at someone else. <coughs> we may be out of touch with our internal affairs because we are still blaming others for our moral choices. Or perhaps we avoid self-examination by making moral inventories of the people around us. When God asked Adam and Eve about their sin, they each pointed a finger at someone else. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. He actually blamed God. He said, it was the woman you gave me. So he was talking to God there. It was the woman that you gave me, Lord. It was had nothing to do with me. You gave it to me. God, it was your fault. And believers, 
Why God? Why are you doing this to me? He's starting to blame God for things that happen in our life. Why God? We do the same thing. Why God are you letting this happen to me? Look, where we are today is from our choices and decisions we made in our life. It ain't God. It's you. Now look what it says. And, and the, the, the woman had been done. The, the serpent deceived me, she replied in Genesis 3.11. So it was the serpent that deceived me. No, the devil made me do it. The devil doesn't make us do anything. He gives us a temptation, and guess who carries it out? We do. <laughs> it seems to be human nature to blame others as our first line of defense. We also may avoid our own problems by evaluating and criticizing others. Jesus tells us, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Matthew 7, 3, 5. That's what, you know what he's trying to say? The blind leading the blind. Somebody that's still trapped in something is trying to set someone else free, and they're still trapped there. That's why the world's in the state it's in. The blind leading the blind. While doing this stuff, we must constantly remember that there's a reason of self-examination. We must guard against blaming and examine the lives of others. There will be time in the future for helping others after we have taken responsibility for our own life. Wouldn't it be well, I'm saved. I want to help everybody else get saved. Really? God says, yeah, you're gonna. That's going to take some time. This verse I'm saving you from the power of sin that's still controlling you. Amen. The penalty's been taken care of. But you've still got a lot of stuff that's still controlling you. And you're of no help to anyone else that you deal with. Amen. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. And that's where recovery comes in. and like, oh, I don't need that. <laughs> All right, let's go to seven. Let's, let's read chapter 7. Do not judge others. Yeah. Unbelievers take that to get from others. Yeah, they love it, right? So unbelievers. You judging me? <laughs> I can take it at First Corinthians six, which says, "Yeah, you certainly should be judging people who are sinning inside the church." That's what Paul says. I, if you go to judge, you have to leave the whole world if you want to judge the world. But the people that are sinning in the church who are supposed to judge that sin, if they are sinning, it's commanded in the Bible. Instead of letting it go to the little leaven, leavens the whole lot. The, first, the next thing you know is you've got a, a, the, the, the biggest sin going on in church. Look at verse 1. Do not judge others and you will not be judged, for you'll be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye? When you have a log in your own, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So this is where step four comes in. Let's deal with the, let's deal with the log that's in my eye. Isn't it so easy to find out what's wrong with everybody else and say, oh yeah, you know, I can help them. I know what's wrong with them. Look what they're doing. Yeah, hello? You do the very same things, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. whatever, you're, whatever you're pointing out to someone else is what you have. Because you can see it in them, but you can't see it in yourself. Amen. And here's where step four comes in. And most people won't sit down and do this stuff because they do not want to look what it was in the mirror and say it's me. But once you do, then you can start getting set free of the things that are holding you in bondage as a believer. Amen? Amen? Now look what it says. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't draw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls and then turn and attack you. Yeah. You ever try to correct somebody that's not looking for correction? <laughs> <laughs> Which is like most of the world. Look, when you're in recovery, you're looking to see what's wrong with you. But when you're not in recovery, 
when you're not in recovery and you're trying to like correct somebody, it's like wasting your time. Because they're not looking for correction. Because there ain't nothing wrong with them, it's the rest of the world that's wrong. But when you're looking inwardly at yourself and you're in recovery, if your heart is right and somebody tries to say something, look, man, that's off. And that just ain't right. He's going to be like, thank you for showing me that because I couldn't see it. Remember that little guy cricket dirt at King David? Calling him an adulterer, a murderer? And the other said, oh, what are you doing? Talking to the king like that. Didn't you know, let him go. God sent him. Believe me when I tell you, unbelievers, they get in your face and judge you, are sent by God because believers ain't got the courage to do it. Yeah. So when somebody's correcting you and showing you, oh, yo, Joe Christian, you say you love Jesus. Remind me not to go where you go. <laughs> and God sent them. Because there's other Christians that don't love each other enough to correct them when they know they need correction. Yeah. Amen? Amen? But we're not like that here. We, we're in recovery. We need correction, obviously. Or else we wouldn't be here. Then you'll get, you judging me? <laughs> well, people just justify it. You might get that from an unbeliever. You're judging. But when an unbeliever is judging a believer, let me tell you something. There's something going on there. Because let me tell you something about the unbelieving world. They're watching believers. Don't think they're not watching you. You tell them where you are. You're in Jesus, you love Jesus, and then they're watching you. Every move you make, everything that comes out of your mouth, everything you're listening to, every way you're going. So don't think living right has nothing to do with being a Christian. It has everything so you can bring others into the kingdom. Amen? Mm -hmm. That's why we have to get right and do this work. Can I get an amen for that? Mm -hmm. All right. If not, an ouch. Now look at it. effective prayer. Let's keep going. Keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? <laughs> or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? <laughs> Please, I hope you don't. <laughs> of course not. Then he's saying, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Amen. Mm -hmm. Our Father in heaven, he wants, listen, God wants to bless each and every one of his kids with the best of everything. Let me tell you something. The problem is you're not ready to receive it, and you can't handle it, the blessing. That's why. Because what does it do? It takes us away from him when we get blessed. Yeah. We get blessed materially, we start what? Walking away from God. Yeah. All right, let's, let, let's read the golden rule now. Twelve. <clears throat> do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. Mm -hmm. This is the essence of all that's taught in the law and the prophets. Wow, see that one paragraph? The whole Bible's wrapped up into that one verse. Do unto others whatever you want. You know when you screw up? The last thing you need is someone to come and judge you. You need what? Mercy, compassion, and you want people to give you a break, right? Because you messed up. So if you will just do that when somebody messes up with you, you'd have great relationships with people. Because yeah. God, that, every time I mess up, Jesus says, I don't see that anymore. Yeah. It's, it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Every day when you wake up, the Bible says, whatever happened yesterday has to be gone. Have to clean the slate. And let me tell you something. People in the flesh are ultimate scorekeepers. Mm -hmm. And God says, no. I don't remember any of yours. Why are you remembering this? Mm -hmm. and this is why we have to do a fourth step. Because we get stuck deep in there. And we keep in score. We can remember things that were done to us when we were this big. Mm -hmm. Still holding on to it and resenting people that did it. Yeah. Instead of forgiving them like God in heaven forgives us. Okay. And it holds us in bondage. 
But it tells us. Now, let's keep going to the narrow gate here, verse 13, very interesting scripture. You can enter God's kingdom only through a narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and his gate is wide for many who choose that way. So we have a choice, right? Yes. We have a choice from the, the road that goes to heaven and the highway that leads to hell. Now look what it says. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only few ever find it. Well, he's not talking about salvation. There. Obviously, the salvation is not hard. It's not difficult. Amen. What he's talking about is the road that leads to life while you're here. Dealing with your sinful nature, getting on the right road. It's very long and very difficult, and very few believers ever find that road. Amen. We're going to heaven, but down here, we're still living in the old sin nature and not enjoying any of the things Jesus died to give us now. Amen. It's very, look at it says. Only a few ever find it. Or else, why isn't this room filled with people wanting to deal with their sin nature and get on the road that leads to life? Amen. Because they're on the road that leads to destruction, but they're going to heaven, but down here they're not. They're living in hell. Amen. 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 I won't go with that road. I ain't going down that road no more. I'm staying on this road. Come hell or high water, I'm staying on the road that leads to life. And the, root, and, the, and the road that leads to life is putting my sin nature to death. And if you don't put your sin nature to death, you can't get on the road that leads to life. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. That's what recovery is all about, putting our sin nature to death. Look what it said, the tree is true. Verse, let's keep going, verse 15. And we're the false prophets or teachers who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, you can identify people by their actions. Bible is clear on that. Mm -hmm. The way we think, the way we act shows us what kind of fruit we are. Amen? Amen. Let's keep going. True disciples. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter. Will enter. So yeah. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now, it says I never knew you. Listen, having God and knowing God is two different things. You have God the moment you believe in him. You don't know God the moment you believe in him, though. You understand? There's a difference there. Having him and knowing him is two different things. The moment you believe in him, you have him. But getting to know him, it says it right here. Look what it says. Get away. Look what it says. I never knew you. Why did you never know? Why did you never know people? Even Christians. I don't know you. You have him, but I don't know you. I never had a relationship with you. Amen. Never. It says, get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now, building, Jesus said, building on a solid foundation. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. Now, just imagine trying to build your house on sand. Look what it says. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. What's he talking about there? How can I relate that to me? When all the problems come and the situations come in your life, you fall apart and crumble because you're not built on a solid foundation, which is Jesus. Amen. The rock I stand, all other ground is sink and stand. When Jesus had finished saying these things, 
The crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious laws. Now, now I just want to give you this little information on the, building on a solid foundation. We've already built our lives on a foundation, and it's a foundation of Satan in the world system. In order to build a new house on the new foundation, all that other stuff has to get torn down for us. And the new foundation has to be laid. Because our, our house is built on all misconception and deception of the world system. To him. It has to get all torn down again, and it has to get filled on this foundation. Where Jesus is the rock, which is the word. So if you, if you put this down, the foundation is not complete. You can't. You're not building your house. You have a foundation, but you're not building your house on it. What is the house? We're the house. We're the spiritual house. We're the temple. We're the new temple of God. He's building a new temple, and that's why we have to get born again. He's building that temple, but the old temple has to get torn down. That's why he said, remember what Jesus said? I get a tear that that temple's going to be destroyed, and I'm going to rebuild it in three days. He's talking about the new temple. This temple has to be torn down of the world system and rebuilt on the new temple, which is Jesus. The problem is we still get infected with this world system in our heads and we bring it into church. And it has to get torn down in order to get rebuilt on a solid foundation of the teachings of Jesus. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. And we have to find out what needs to get torn down and that's why we do step four. Maybe, a searching in moral inventory. Let's see what's wrong with our, with our character. We have to see what's wrong with it before God can do anything with it. That's why it's so important that we learn how to have constructive criticism, constructive sorrow. I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to, I want to show you what it produces. The Bible's clear on what it produces. 1487. Page 1489, it talks about constructive sorrow. See it? We're going to read the account, and I want to read that to you. We all have to deal with sorrow. We may try to stuff it down and ignore it. We may try to drown it by giving in to our addiction or avoid feeling it by intellectualizing. But some, sorrow doesn't go away. We need to accept the sorrow that will be part of the inventory process. Not all sorrow is bad for us. The Apostle Paul had written in a letter to the church in Corinth that made them very sad because Paul confronted them about something they were doing wrong. At first he was sorry that he had hurt them, but later he said, now I'm glad I said it, not because it hurt you, because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. God wants his people to have. See it? For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no, great, there's no regret for that kind of sorrow. Just see what this godly sorrow produced in you. You show that you have done everything necessary to make things right. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 to 11. Jeremiah said, though God brings grief, he also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love. For he does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. Lamentation 3.32-33. The Corinthians' grief was good. It came from honest self-evaluation, not morbid self-condemnation. We can learn to accept our sorrow as a positive part of recovery, not as punishment. Amen? Amen. All right, let's read the account in, verse, in chapter 7, verse 8. There's, so, there's such a lesson in this. When I read it, I said, wow, there's a real lesson in this. I'm not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Church discipline. Now I'm glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed by us in any way. 
for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin, see it? Away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, listen to this one, which lacks repentance, which is change, look what it does. It results in spiritual death. Just see what this godly sorrow produced in you. Such earnestness, such concern to clear yourself, such indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, and such a readiness to punish wrong. You show that you have done everything necessary to make things right. My purpose then was not to write to you who wrong or who was wrong. I wrote to you so that you in the sight of God can see for yourselves how loyal you are to us. We have been greatly encouraged by this. Amen. So Step four, worldly sorrow and godly sorrow is two different things. What do you mean? Well, when you're sorry for something in the world and you just keep doing it, that's worldly sorrow. There's no spirituality about that at all. There's no change. But when you actually get to step nine and actually make an amend to somebody, an amend is a change. Look, I am no longer practicing that behavior anymore. I am a new, pre I am a new person. I don't do that anymore. It's, it's, it produces what? Spiritual growth. But we'll be just saying, oh, I'm sorry. How many, how many times have we said to people, sorry, and do it again? Sorry. That's not godly sorrow. That's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow, what leads us what? Away from sin and towards repentance. Can I get an amen for that? Yeah. And that's why we have to do a step four. We're going to be sorry that we did some of that. going to be sorry. I know I, a lot of things that I did, I have regrets for. I hope you do. But God uses all that stuff to show us that he has something better for us. But the regrets are there to what? Show us that we don't want to continue in that anymore. If you're continuing in it, you don't regret it. Obviously. And we only deceive ourselves. Can I get an amen for that? All right, thank you for letting me share that. Just, just remember, do this work. It's worth it. It'll set you free.